We are um, <clears throat> delighted to have with us Dr. Sarah Booth today. Dr. Booth has, <clears throat> excuse me, a joint clinical and research role. She is Macmillan Consultant in Palliative Medicine, Clinical Director of Palliative Care at Addenbrooke's, Associate Lecturer, University of Cambridge, and Honorary Senior Lecturer at the Department of Palliative Care and Policy at King's College London. In learning about Dr. Booth for today, I was struck by her long-standing interest in breathlessness. I believe it started in her first specialist palliative care role at uh, St. Christopher's Hospice in London. And there she carried out a trial of the effectiveness of oxygen air in relieving cancer dyspnea. In later roles, she validated the shuttle walking test in assessing functional capacity for people with breathlessness. And she has studied mindfulness in the management of breathlessness and other chronic conditions. Dr. Booth founded the research-based breathlessness service at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge to help people living with breathlessness and to learn more about how to improve their care, ensuring that they get all the help that they need. And as I understand it, she is one of the very few people who's doing this type of research um, outside of the cancer context. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Dr. Booth. <laughs> Right. Thank you very much for that generous introduction, and thank you for inviting me to join your group. I must say I had a wonderful evening last night. Thank you, Professor Tassfield. But actually what was so wonderful was to meeting you uh, who are living with Lamb and your family and living so very positively and impressively, and I've heard more of that this morning. So um, as Kelly mentioned, I, had, I started out uh, in... Uh, a conventional palliative care background, if I can put it that way, by working in hospices and mostly with cancer patients. But I was in post uh, as clinical director, I actually left as clinical director in 2012 at Addenbrooke's. Um, to, I was I came to Addenbrooke's to found the palliative care service, maintaining my interest in breathlessness that had started at St. Christopher's and started to work much more with people with non-malignant diseases. Of course, most of that was uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, but as I understand it, some of the changes, uh, the end result is very like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. But what has struck me is that you are living with breathlessness at a much younger age than most of the people with chronic obstructive of pulmonary disease, so therefore with uh, different preoccupations around work and childcare, um, and also living with a condition that isn't recognised by many people, and I think that uh, brings its own uh, difficulties. So what I was going to start by doing um, was talking about management, self-management of breathlessness with some very specific breathlessness um, techniques and then move into um, talking about those things that are about mostly living with a chronic condition which overlap with breathlessness. Now to support, I haven't used lots of the uh, academic papers but I have brought these along which were written for the clinicians our, our breathlessness manual about how to set up a breathlessness service but that has a lot of the references in the back and a lot of the practical information. I've also uh, would reference our, I brought 40 of these positions uh, information sheets about pos positions and breathing techniques to help breathlessness, but they're on our website, which I'll also reference at the end, along with eight other information sheets that you can download, and a couple of films, and also the wellbeing journal, which I'll say a bit more about. So there are copies of those outside for people just to, to, to take. Okay, so I'm going back to 1966, when there was the first symposium on breathlessness. Um, uh, as you know, management of symptoms often takes second place to management of disease. And we can think of a disease illness model. The disease is the condition like lamb. The illness is the impact it has on our own lives and how we live with that. And today when I talk about lives, I mean lives of carers as well as lives of patients. Actually, 
how patients and carers understand breathlessness has a lot to do with how effective management is going to be. So when I talk about those who are, have a, uh, the illness has an impact on, I am talking about friends and family as well, and we'll say more about that at the end. Now, Julius Comro, who is a cardiologist, gave perhaps, I think, the most helpful definition of breathlessness, though, of course, it succeeded in the academic literature uh, by the ATS uh, definition which I'll come on to. But he talks about an unpleasant type of breathing. And someone pointed out to me last night that really the, using the word breathlessness wasn't quite accurate because it isn't like the breathlessness you have when you're healthy. Although it may seem like it, there isn't an exhilaration or um, uh, a feeling of achievement associated with the breathlessness of illness. So Julius Comro hit the nail on the head by talking about it being unpleasant. It's subjective. That means that actually only the person suffering the breathlessness can really understand or rate it. It's, you can't look at someone and say, well, you're not that breathless. You know, it's actually entirely subjective. And we'll come on to discuss more about that. And like pain, it involves both the perception, so that's in a way about our, our, our brains and our lungs and our heart, but also our reaction to the sensation. And perhaps that's the bit that we can control. We can learn ways to reduce the impact of the sensation on us. So if I, if I was to say one thing that I think is very important to understand today and helps us to to learn how to manage breathlessness or reduce its impact rather than learn how to manage it. Uh, and this map is in there. Breathlessness is in the brain. Okay. So although the things that make, the changes that make us feel breathless, the pathology, if you like, is in our heart or our lungs or our chest, I'm talking more generally than, than lamb now, we actually experience breathlessness through our brains. And there's two areas, um, two divisions rather than areas, I haven't gone down to the, the specific areas in this, but actually there's a, a very rather an automatic uh, area of the brain in the brain stem that almost works like a thermostat or any other control center that we're used to, receiving signals and setting a rhythm, allowing, like, I can breathe and I'm talking and I'm not thinking about that. I can walk upstairs, I can dive into a pool. All those things, for those of us without problems with our breathing, are completely automatic. And actually, when we become breathless or have a problem that makes us breathless, we have an uncomfortable awareness of the need to breathe. It becomes much more conscious for us. And our brain stem is the area that automatically is generating the rhythm. But actually, our brain stem is the uh, is affected by our higher centers, what we call our higher centers. The thinking and feeling part of us can affect our, our, our way that we breathe. And that's the bit that we can learn to alter the higher centre of the brain and uh, uh, affect the way that the, the pattern and, uh, uh, of our breathing. So the American Thoracic Society had a working party on breathlessness in 1999, perhaps the first time they'd considered it as a symptom. And again, they came up with that word subjective. As it's an experience, it's not a simple, uh, like a pain can be complex. You can think of simple pains as the ones where you touch a burning a burning oven or something. It's just a completely arc to the brain that's very easy to understand, doesn't have long-standing impact. But when you start to have chronic breathlessness or any chronic condition, it becomes intermingled with the phys physiological, psychological, social and environmental factors, which is where uh, what we've learned about breathing comes in, how we organize the space around us, the reaction of those around us can have an impact on our breathing. And I remember talking to people last night about what's unhelpful and unhelpful for people to do, and perhaps almost feeling stalked sometimes by people saying, oh, I'll stay with you while you're breathless, and actually, no, I'd like to be on my own, you know, or please um, don't uh, tell me to sit down or tell me 
not to panic or tell me not to get anxious because those are actually extremely unhelpful things for people to say. So actually our breathlessness can get worse because of what people is saying to us or how they're reacting. That's about the environment and the psychological. I think it's also important that they pointed out qualitatively distinct sensations. We're used to thinking that way perhaps with pain, it's certainly in medicine we think of burning, shooting, uh, you know, the ordinary pain that you get in everyday life, aching. But actually, in breathlessness, there are two, there are many sensations. In asthma, you get chest tightness, but also in um, breathlessness, two really important ones are the sensation of air hunger, of just not getting enough oxygen or air in, and how frightening and terrifying that is. Uh, and the other one is work of breathing, where you feel you're, you're, you're having to work so hard to uh, breathe, that those two sensations seem to be very, very important. And in fact, air hunger seems to be the one that's associated with more terror and distress. Now, I'm going to go straight on in talking about techniques to the handheld fan. And this was actually quite important in my early research. The first bit of research I did, um, as Kelly mentioned, was uh, a randomized control chair of oxygen versus air. And this was in cancer patients in a hospice, in association with Professor Guz, who was one of the people at that original sym uh, symposium, and he, 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 di he died recently. And actually, um, it seemed obvious to most people that oxygen uh, may must be something that would help breathlessness. Now, oxygen does help uh, an underlying condition. I'm not talking about oxygen that you need for managing your underlying condition, for making sure your blood levels or oxygen are up high enough. But actually, oxygen simply to make you feel less breathless isn't any more effective than air. And this has come out of several other studies as well, including uh, a, a big Alti Center randomized control trial that was published in the Lancet about three years ago from Amy Abernathy. But actually, the handheld fan for a long time, people who've suffered from breathlessness have said uh, in heart failure it was very important for us to be taught that people with heart failure like to hang out of the window and, and, and get a draft of air across their face, often don't like the, the the curtains around the bed and that actually it seems that cooling this part of the face for reasons that aren't quite understood some people say it's something to do with the diving reflex or the others say well that's supposed to disappear when you're in, you know in your early 20s so we're trying to understand more about the fan seems to be very effective now not only is it effective um, in terms of reducing the sensation of breathlessness, albeit for a short time, and actually we've just finished a small study that looked at how long it has had an impact in. Unfortunately, we did it in people who are breathless at rest for reasons I, I won't go into, but it, it, the impact seems to last for an hour or more. You wouldn't think that. But actually, the moment you give somebody who's had a, who's had a condition like breathlessness where they haven't felt there's anything they can do about it, and you hand them something very simple, and uh, effective at palliating breathlessness, it actually alters their attitude to going out, to being active, because actually they now have something they can do to intervene with the breathlessness at quite an early stage. And what we do find is it also reduces the recovery time, which is another thing. I mean, if you have an attack of breathlessness, which then takes you 20 minutes to really get over, that's a disincentive to doing things. But if you have, if you can actually recover more quickly using something simple like this, which is a very normal piece of um, equipment, so it's not quite as, some people find it stigmatizing to be using some sort of a medical equipment in public. So having something like this, this is quite normal, can make quite a difference. It's also cheap, so it's possible to have one upstairs, one at the top of the stairs, one halfway up the stairs, one in the glove compartment, one in your handbag, because it's easily portable. So uh, the fan or is not only about reducing the sensation of breath by cooling the face, but also by changing our thoughts and feelings about breathlessness by having something that we can intervene with quite early on. Okay, I think people often, one of the things we had to get over 
is that uh, people thought, well, why is somebody giving me something like that? It's just, you know, a no how can that possibly have an impact? And a lot of um, clinicians just don't believe that it can actually work. But uh, actually, that is why it's very key for someone when they give someone a fan to sit down and give some explanation about it and also to talk about the scientific rationale and the work that's been done. We have done a crossover randomised controlled trial of the fan as well as doing these other sub-studies that are looking at the way it's used. And the first thing before people even learn breathing techniques or positions, the first thing to understand is perhaps how to use a fan because it's so simple. And if, um, if someone is f feeling so overwhelmed by being breathless that they can't take in positions, just understanding that if you sit down, go into the forward lean position and focus on the out breath, the in breath take care of itself, <coughs> always the in breath takes care of itself that actually the fan can be a very useful way of reducing that feeling of anxiety. We're going to talk a lot more about anxiety and feelings of anxiety. So when overwhelmed by a feeling of breathlessness, although I, I know somebody uh, I was talking to last night said they didn't like sitting down when they were breathless and everybody has to find out what's absolutely best for them, but starting with the thing that helps for most people. Uh, recovery breathing that we teach is to, to stop what you're doing. I mean, one, uh, uh, Kelly referred to the shuttle walking test I did when I was at uh, the hospice in Cambridge, uh, in Oxford. And the shuttle walking test is where you walk up and down between two um, uh, traffic cones, 10, 10 meters or 10 yards apart. And intermittently, on bleep, there's a bleep goes that asks you to walk further and faster. And when I started that work in the 1990s, there hadn't been all the uh, publicity about how good exercise were for you. And I, I, I felt like an almost an art, a Nazi in the hospice asking people to do this test because, you know, uh, are you sure that won't be bad for people? And actually what happened was we by chance, we didn't do it by planning, now we would do it by planning because we learned from that, but a lot of people had their relatives came to do that. And of course the relatives saw them walking up and down, getting breathless, but then becoming unbreathless. We weren't even using the, uh, we were using the fan a bit, but not in a systematic way then, simply by stopping what they were doing. And it had a huge transformational effect, which was the other thing that helped me with my decide who needed to be in the breathlessness service, was that actually people seeing that, yes, you, you got breathless, but then you became unbreathless, um, changed their, the, 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 their attitude to allowing, and that does happen with relatives sometimes, allowing or encouraging their loved one to exercise. Because if you, if you know that someone you love is getting breathless and that's very distressing to watch, particularly if you don't know what to do about it, you're going to discourage that person from exercising. Uh, you don't want to see that, you don't want to be put in that helpless position. But actually, as uh, we'll come back to, uh, being inactive actually ultimately makes you less fit, which makes you breathless at a lower level of activity, which actually uh, instigates this spiral of disability. So knowing what to do, like this recovery breathing position, sitting down, taking up a forward lean position, focusing on the out breath, using the fan. That's uh, giving two people information about how to manage breathlessness, which then makes it possible for the person to be more active, which in turn has an impact on their breathlessness. And I'm sure you've all um, known, and we'll come on again to this, that actually using the upper part of your chest is the least effective way of helping your breathlessness, and it's trying to uh, use your um, uh, breathe with your diaphragm, so watching your abdomen go in and out rather than the chest go up and down, that's important, and I'll say a, a bit more about that. Focus on the out breath, just having that in your mind when you're breathless being the easy first step. 
Now, for some people that, that we work with, uh, something like a rollator who uh, is also a very helpful aid to becoming less breathless because it actually supports activity and also allows people to, or enables rather than allows, to carry things around with them. I mean, I had a woman who was very breathless uh, who used it, it, found it very useful because she could then walk up the hill to her neighbour to have a bridge game, you know, and took all, all the stuff she needed with her. So things like walking aids can be very helpful um, and uh, walking around the supermarket, I think someone else mentioned this, that kind of height of being able to stop and, and lean forward on that is also very helpful for managing your breathlessness. Pursed lip breathing is another technique. Have, have any of you been uh, taught pursed lip breathing? It's almost a way of keeping the uh, 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 airways open by imposing a kind of peep uh, when, you're, uh, w when you adopt this position. So it's a way of it trying to focus on the out breath through partially closed lips. As, uh, and these normal things you do when you make a candle flame flicker, when you're trying to whistle, or when you're about to blow a kiss. So thinking of that, trying to think of your exhalation length, expanding on that, making it twice the length of your inspiration, four times the length of your in breath uh, until your natural breath comes to an end. Focus on the out breath. Positions can be very important, and somebody else mentioned that last night about learning about positions that are helpful. They're all ones that are putting your respiratory mechanics at, at their best advantage. Slight forward leans you can see in all of those, uh, and actually finding somewhere that you, when you're caught breathless, taking up this position to aid your recovery more quickly. And there's more about that on the website too. Walking aids of different types. And sometimes um, uh, you, you, when your breathlessness, you notice your breathlessness is getting worse, because I know in, 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 in LAM that sometimes it's progressive or there are plateaus, but then periods of progression. It may be about reassess reassessing your breathlessness at every time. Now, I know if your breathlessness gets worse, it's important for you to be medically examined to make sure you, you know there hasn't been a pneumothorax or another in uh, medical episode. But if your breathing is entering into a period when it's less well, it's about going back to the basics again and saying, what's going to help me now? Is there an aid or another technique that I can introduce at this stage, which wasn't necessary or helpful before, that's now going to be of use. So being reassessed from your symptom point of view, as well as your disease point of view at different stages. Some people, this isn't something that we use, but it's used widely at King's, who we collaborate with a lot. Some people find it helpful to have a, a, a poem that they can remember. Obviously, all these slides will, will be available, uh, uh, so you don't have to take notes now, um, to remind you, to bring you back to that way of breathing that's going to be most effective for you. Another thing that we do is write for specific people, rituals for crises, onto little sheets that we then laminate, uh, so that when somebody's feeling breathless in the early stages, and you know, learning to manage breathlessness is a training, so you may need reminders now and again, being able to draw it out and, and actually look at it, and also having one for the carer as well. And actually, something like this poem, or the ritual where you, you say, your job when I'm breathless is to bring me my fan and to open it out so that the person who's watching and feeling helpless has something positive to do can also be very important. I'm now going to come on to activity and other ways that, uh, of living that are important for living with a chronic condition. A chronic condition with periods of unpredictability, a chronic condition where even the treatment, as someone described to me last night, waiting for a transplant and various false alarms and other uh, incredibly stressful events that, 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 that they went through. So resilience is even more important in someone living with a chronic condition or living with someone with a chronic condition than in other conditions. And I came across these um, when I was looking uh, 
at positive psychology interventions. Actually, people who use the breathlessness service, when we were evaluating it, said what they liked was a focus on what was still working in their lives rather than what had been lost. And actually, we didn't know we were doing that particularly, but it led me into a search for positive psychology interventions in a small trial, which I can say more about it over, over lunch or tea or something. But actually it led to uh, a look at the literature and very, very, uh, in the last um, five or six years, the Foresight team, who are part of the government's um, chief scientific officer's uh, remit, they looked at ways of building mental resilience and came up with these five ways to well-being. Well-being, they defined as a sense when uh, people still find a sense of engagement with the world. Now, I felt like jettisoning this part of the talk last night because I've never met a more motivated and positive group of people than I met last night, but I will go through it even if it just reaffirms what you almost already know. Having a sense of engagement with the world around you can be lost easily when you have a, a, a chronic illness because of all the preoccupations and the things that you have to do to actually manage your illness and you can feel divorced from the wider world that clearly hasn't happened to this group but having maintaining a sense of engagement with life and with um, uh, the, those things that are important to you are important for a sense of well-being having meaning being involved in something bigger than ourselves like lamb action uh, is also critical for a sense of well-being and actually pleasurable activities. And what surprised me when I was doing uh, the study that we did, which was in people with advanced cancer, but actually they almost felt guilty about planning pleasurable activities. And actually having pleasure, doing enjoyable things should be something that you feel is important for your health, not just as a kind of indulgence. It's actually important for your, uh, your, your mental resilience. So these five ways to well-being which we will go through and which are in that well-being journal are important. I didn't talk about exercise earlier because it came under activity. But exercise, there is evidence from the 1970s about the importance of exercise in managing breathlessness. It seems to work in two ways. One, if we become deconditioned or in everyday life unfit, our muscle structure actually changes. It becomes less, our muscles become less effective at dealing with oxygen, the fuel that we have. Uh, and actually, we, uh, that spiral of disability which can come about through feeling breathless, uh, which is an unpleasant feeling to feel, avoiding it, so therefore doing less, so therefore you become less and less fit, your muscles become less and less efficient at using what fuel they do have. It means that in, in the end, um, you can become more breathless than you need be. Now, I know with a progressive illness, uh, you can become very breathless because of the illness. I'm not trying to pretend you can overcome that with your m mind over matter. I'm saying being as active as you can be can help you to maintain, uh, maintain your uh, fitness for as long as possible so your fitness doesn't become a component in your breathlessness. Now, activity is also um, talking to a highly motivated group of people. I, I, I also am worried because I don't want people to feel if they go out and flog themselves on a treadmill that that is a way of becoming fit you know, when actually that's not what their respiratory system would allow them to do. Activity is mental as well as physical and it's thinking how do I stay as fit as I possibly can uh, with the condition I have and it may mean about taking advice and actually being very creative at looking at ways uh, that you can maintain activity. Activity has to be enjoyable, not a chore, and it has to be something you can integrate into your life. But once one understands, and this, uh, th this is one of the first statements on our general sheet about breathlessness, that although the feeling of being breathless is extremely unpleasant, horrible, and frightening in many ways, it isn't actually um, doing us harm. Being breathless isn't harming us. So therefore, it, being breathless isn't something we have to avoid. Also, cognitively, thinking about that higher part of our brain, the thinking and feeling part of us, um, 
being breathless, uh, we aren't going to, uh, at the moment of being breathless, it's very common to feel, I'm never going to get my breath back. I'm never going to get my breath back. I'm never going to return. Even though you've been breathless lots of times before, it can feel overwhelming sometimes. And that's where you have to use that cognitive training. Um, I've been breathless before. I managed to recover my breathlessness. Uh, I, can, I will get back to being um, unbreathless. I need to you know, sit down, take the forward lean, use my breath, or take out your sheet to remind you of that. So activity is something that's really important to maintain to the best of your ability. And doing it may is, is, is highly individualized. But I would th urge you to think creatively. So if, you're, um, if you've been very deconditioned or uh, maybe singing would be a, a, a good start, you know, even having a, 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 an odd singing lesson. It's a, a, that's a mental and a bit of physical acti activity. But doing something, it doesn't have to be a gym, it doesn't have to be running, and it doesn't have to be doing something unpleasant that you never wanted to do ever in your life before. It has to be something you, that pleases you and ha feeds that other thing, that other sensation of well-being. We'll come back about to that in a minute. The other one is take notice. Now this comes down often to um, it's a feeling of living in the present, and that's why we got interested in mindfulness. It's a bit of a rotten word, I think, mindfulness, and I don't think mindfulness is the only way of achieving this. But it's something about living in the present not loading present things up with what's happened to us in the past or what we're worrying about in the future. So very commonly with an illness, and particularly now I'm sure a number of you, it was a while before you got diagnosed, even after you were feeling unwell. And so you think, well, if, on, if only this hadn't happened, or if only that hadn't happened, or, you know, and in the future you think, well, what's going to happen to me in five years' time? How am I going to be in five years' time? And that kind of invades the present all the time and stops an enjoyment of, of, of the present. So mindfulness, which... Um, uh, is a training again, it's an eight week course, a group course, a group activity, if you actually do mindfulness based stress reduction, with a one day retreat um, and home practice of mindfulness meditation that you consider in continuing to the long term, is a way of training your mind to live in the present. There are other ways of doing this. Mindfulness has come to the fore because a lot of research has been done on it, uh, which has demonstrated its, its effectiveness, uh, firstly in, in mental illness, in anxiety and depression, but now it's coming through in things like breast cancer and um, uh, other can, other and COPD actually. The thing about um, uh, mindfulness, how it's thought to work, is that depression is thought. Uh, rumination is a characteristic of depression, and it's thought that mindfulness r reduces the amount of rumination we do. That is what I referred to earlier. If only this hadn't happened, if only that hadn't happened, what if, what if that? You, you, you learn to stop doing that, and that helps you to reduce depression, but also anxiety. The other one is connect. Now, this is a connection activity. And obviously this group is highly supportive, like the lamb line is a highly supportive thing. Making connections with people uh, is highly, if, extremely important to our health and something that can be uh, reduced or lessened by, our, by illness. And it's not only our um, very close relationships, our so-called intimate relationships that seem to be important, but also our more superficial or perhaps more casual relationships that seem to form a part uh, of our infrastructure, our mental resilience infrastructure. And actually, ha having something like Connect, you can't sort of tick off, well, I've met five more people. I'm not suggesting you do that, but thinking, yes, if you're feeling low or you're feeling less well, you're thinking, this is the time I perhaps ought to go and do something that's going to connect me with other people. This is the time maybe I ought to use lamb line. Maybe this is the time I ought to phone someone else. Uh, it's, it's that kind of feeling that, uh, yes, this will actually help my health. It's not just a matter of phoning someone up for a conversation. 
give altruism and often in palliative care when we, we do research one of the reasons that people cite for taking part in research is because they're very sick of being done to you know the feeling of actually participating and helping other people is good for their mental health and of course there's loads of evidence of that today from Jan's presentation but actually giving which doesn't have to be financial actually giving is an important part of our health too it's a feeling of of having the power to do good for other people altruism uh, seems to be important for our health and the last one is keep learning. And actually, chronic illness can be a, a thing that takes, and, and I heard of that, that last night. There's lots of loss associated with chronic illness, and I can see that you're a group that doesn't focus on that. But actually, it may be about learning other things, or learning to do other things, or other ways of living, or if you lose one activity, taking up another, or, or learning to do something in a different way, are all absolutely key for reducing the impact of a chronic illness on your overall mental and physical health. And on, on, on top of that, just if, if you look into the longer term, uh, in terms of keeping our mental faculties alive, which seems to be very important for a healthier old age, always thinking, what can I learn? Curiosity are important things. And sometimes that may just encourage you to do something you've been thinking about for a long time. Uh, not inevitably learning a language, perhaps it's learning a new recipe or going home a different way or taking a new route or taking up something you'd thought of. But those seem to be important things for helping us to live successfully with chronic conditions. Now, chronic condition is different from acute disease in that inevitably, um, inevitably with any chronic illness, it's about learning to manage the anxiety that's perhaps associated either with progression or relapsing or remitting or new investigations or the what ifs. And um, I'll, um, I'll leave some time for finding out uh, or discussing other ways of, of doing that. Our nutrition is important because the, especially when you're diagnosed with something at a young age, which you're going to live with for many years, for decades, those small changes in nutrition can have a cumulative effect. You know, so actually having a poorer diet for a long time is going to have a, a, a big knock-on impact. Exercise is much easier if you keep it up to the, to, to the level which you can manage right from the word go and focusing on that, this is going to help me be as healthy as possible. Social contacts, being aware that depression in both the person with the illness and the carer are more prevalent and therefore we need to seek out and nip it in the bud or take action to avert them, perhaps by using something like mindfulness. And making sure that the people who uh, live with someone with a chronic illness have the least impact of the illness on them as possible. Because um, uh, if... If the carer has to do a lot of physical tasks, it's obvious that can have an impact on their own health, but also in enabling them to have their own lives that are separate uh, and making sure that there's the, the opportunity available to do that. Uh, otherwise, that's going to be a problem in the longer term. I wanted to point out some physio some resources that I that um, may be available and I know you're you're often cared for in Nottingham or the Brompton and at your local center as well and often things like physiotherapists or occupational therapists are going to be people that you're going to use in your local centers occupational therapists are an underused group they can often help you with aids to daily living, with learning anxiety reduction techniques, with something called pacing and prioritizing. If you've got limited energy, it's about using it in the most effective way. And you know, imagining that you have a jug full of energy at the beginning of the day, when, you are, when you're less well, your jug of energy is smaller. So you have to use it in a more um, discriminatory way. And if you're trying to achieve something pleasurable, for example, I'm thinking of a particular patient at the moment didn't obviously have a uh, lamb but um, 
she, she loved to go to car boot sales, but obviously if she used all her energy at walking to where the stalls were, she wasn't going to enjoy the rest of the day. So it was about using something like a, a mobility suit or a chair or even getting a lift, not being embarrassed about saying, I need to use, you know, when you are going to an event, phoning up saying, I need to park near the venue because actually I've got a condition that limits my mobility. All those things are important and occupational therapists can help you with that. Uh, specialist nurses, of, of, uh, of course you were, uh, Sharon, <laughs> and you've, uh, I don't know whether you have them at your local centres, but getting the help you need can prevent problems. Clinical psychologists, someone else mentioned last night how helpful they'd found a clinical psychologist, managing fears, managing anxieties, and, and learning uh, positive interventions to help their health be as good as possible. Now, palliative care um, was associated with solely with end-of-life care, solely with working in hospices, but in hospitals now there are palliative care services, and when your symptoms are very difficult to manage, palliative care services can be of great help, and they're not only dealing with people at the end of life, they're becoming much more used to dealing people with long-term conditions. Tai Chi is another technique, which has, uh, has anyone heard of Tai Chi as a martial art, which is actually important in helping people with balance, but also anxiety reduction. Again, you've got to pick one that you like, but recently I've had success with people who've taken up Tai Chi. Uh, you go along for six or eight, or it's a long-term commitment, um, which helps you with anxiety reduction as well. Mindfulness training I've mentioned, and the Wellbeing Journal is based on uh, encapsulating the ideas of positive psychology into a journal setting. <sighs> Mindfulness is a big word, it comes up all the time now, but it's simply a way of paying attention to the present moment actively, compassionately and non-judgmentally. So not about saying that was, you, know, you fail every time you try to do this or you don't keep your mind and uh, uh, you don't keep your mind empty, you're not very successful at this. It's learning to shut down autopilot. We found from our CBIS, which is our Cambridge Breathlessness Intervention Service, that actually people wanted to learn the art of relaxation, wanted to learn how to put things in perspective, wanted to learn how to de-emotionalize, uh, take away the um, negative interpretations of what was happening to them, to help them take charge of their own breathlessness. In the, in the Wellbeing Journal, we help you to learn your to use your five senses fully. There's a relaxing body scan in there. There's some mindfulness uh, interventions and yoga stretching exercises. In chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it's been help shown to use help people learn how to uh, have a less distressful interpretation of what's happening. It doesn't change what's happening, but it helps you to change the interpretation of that. I'll skip through the Wellbeing Journal because I've pr produced them with you, but it's actually an undated journal that helps you to use your five senses to record positive events, because recording positive events, even when things are difficult, helps us to focus on the positive. It's not saying everything's positive, it's not being crass and pretending that everything's easy, but it helps you when you're going through a bad patch to remember the good things that happen. And the actions, the connections, it's also got some beautiful images in and um, uh, is a, a, a self-help training for achieving what mindfulness uh, attempts. Tai Chi I've talked about, and I'd like to finish. Andrew Coates was actually a cardiologist, and he was writing an editorial. It's quite old now, this, this editorial, but I think it's wonderfully expressed. He was reviewing how yoga breathing had been shown to improve arterial oxygen saturation in patients with um, heart failure. And he reminded us that there are more ways to improve symptoms, a symptom like breathlessness, it's very complex, than simply stimulating, focusing on the organ that's diseased itself. You have to do that to treat the underlying condition, but you have to do other things as well. And there are mot multiple approaches to intervening with illness, and it's, 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 it's up to you, with help, to find ways that are most effective for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>